Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for coming out to uh, the talk today. I was really curious, I have been really curious to know who would be coming out uh, early in the morning on a Wednesday at a games conference for a talk about curation. And this, you are those people, that is you. And so as, uh, obviously that means that you are the, the, the best people here and the people who care about video games the most. So well done everybody. Um, so uh, yeah, so my name is Marie Falston. I am a playful curator and producer of, uh, or playful curator and producer. And uh, so I'm somebody who's been working for the past sort of eight years or so as a curator in and around video games and playful digital interactive works. Um, the majority of the work that I've done in this space over that time has been sort of quite grassroots or independent. And it's specifically been involved with the exhibition and display of independent and alternative video games. And that has specifically been work that I've undertaken as part of a collective that I'm the co-founder of and a co-collaborator with, which is Wild Rumpus. So you can see some photographs here of some of the work and the projects that I've undertaken previously, but um, that is not really the work that I'm going to talk about uh, this morning because sadly, I don't have, uh, we've got 30 minutes today, and I don't think in 30 minutes I can quite unpack or explain why two grown men are stood in a paddling pool riding around with move controllers tied to their limbs. So if at the end of the talk, when you get the surveys asking you to rate the talk, if it's highly rated enough, then I promise I'll be back next year to unpack and explain that. Um, but yeah, so, um, so today I'm not really here today to talk about the work that I've done uh, as part of Wild Rumpus, although that's something that I very much consider to be part of uh, my curatorial practice. Instead, I'm here to talk to you about the work that I've been undertaking over the past four years at uh, this institution, at this place. So if you're unfamiliar, this uh, beautiful building that you're looking at is uh, the Victorian Albert Museum uh, in London. This is one of the world's largest museums of design and it's a museum that's really interested in design process. And I've been really fortunate to have the, had the opportunity and the privilege to have worked here for the past four years as, the, uh, as their curator of video games. Um, and that work across that time has been primarily spent uh, working as the lead curator of a major exhibition that took place at the museum uh, from September 2018, and it closed a matter of weeks ago uh, on February 24th, uh, 2019. And that exhibition was, uh, as you can see, was video games design, play, disrupt. This was a major exhibition that looked at video game design uh, through a very sort of contemporary lens. Um, I say, although the exhibition has closed, it's one that is going on to tour internationally. It's going to be opening at V&A Dundee uh, on the 20th of April this year before going on to visit other institutions internationally. So if you've not had a chance to catch the show, then hopefully you will bump into it at some museum or gallery uh, on its travels around the world over the next sort of few years. So as I stand here today as the lead curator on that exhibition, I have to acknowledge obviously that this is a project that has taken around about from end to end, this took four years to undertake. And it's a project that was realized with the work and dedication and contribution of a team of hundreds. This is a project that sort of encompassed project curators, conservators, interpreters, uh, con conservators, designers, builders, editors, filmmakers, academics, developers, games designers who lent their works to the show. And so I've put up here just a few of the names from some of the key contributors to the exhibition who worked on that project over the years that creating an exhibition is a complex and uh, complicated task. And so just to call out a few of the, the sort of really key people that worked on the exhibition. So Christian Volsing, who was the exhibition's research curator, who was my curatorial partner in crime, uh, especially our exhibition management team, uh, Samantha King, Anna Belen Martinez, uh, Ruth Law and Tessa Pierce, and our exhibitions management team are really sort of the producers of the exhibition, and they were an absolute powerhouse of a team that pulled off an incredibly impressive and complex feat with this exhibition. We're really fortunate to work along some amazing designers, who are exhibition designers, Pinella Orstedt Studio, and Squint Opera, who undertook the AV uh, design of the exhibition, and also Julia, who did our sort of 2D and our graphic design. So, 
often this is the point in when I'm talking about the exhibition that I'm normally lobbying for sort of uh, the, the, the to, to, to lobby to audiences about the value of the impact of video games in museums. But stood here at the Game Developers Conference, I don't feel that you're an audience that really needs to be won round about the virtues or the significance of video games as a really fascinating and important contemporary design discipline. But Still, video games within cultural institutions such as the VNA is still rare and unexpected and unusual. But for any institution that is engaging with design or contemporary design, video games are an a sig hugely significant force uh, within our culture today. And as such, they are a medium that institutions need to be engaging with and embracing. There are an estimated 2.2 billion people in the world today who play video games. That's a quarter of the world's population. And when we look at the fact that, say, the 2017 finals of the League of Legends World Championships took place in the Beijing's Bird's Nest, uh, Bird Nest Arena, or stadium, which is an Olympic stadium that has a capacity of 80,000. We can see the scale and reach of video games, and it's undeniable. And we also see these cultural spaces that video games now occupy. But when we talk about or try to justify video games through these numbers, we're really only looking at the medium from afar. We're looking at it uh, through this sort of sense of scale of reach of an industry. And those facts and figures to me don't necessarily do the work that is needed to begin to open up or Im to really manifest and make sort of make sort of visible what is so fascinating and unique about video game design. And so in the very early stages of the exhibition, I worked a lot to try and find a core quote or a concept or an idea that to me got to the sort of fundamental aspects of what makes video games such a unique and fascinating discipline. And I came across this quote, which was a line from Frank Lance's talk, Hearts and Minds, which is a really great talk from GDC that he presented in 2014. And this is a quote that says, making games combines everything that's hard about building a bridge and everything that's hard about composing an opera. Games are operas made out of bridges. Now, this is a really confident and bombastic statement. Here we're aligning video games with the sort of cultural heights of operas and with an equally forms such as, these essential forms such as engineering. But for me, not just that confidence in this statement, but also the fact that this is a statement that allows us to view video games as this system, this sort of cultural form that sort of embodies this subjective emotional aesthetic design, but also this objective system design of, of systems, of engineering, of rules. And there is a fascinating tension where those two points meet. And for me, that is what we wanted to get to the heart of in this exhibition, to evoke and instill in people uh, what is so important and unique and equally for me, the, this space, when we were able to reduce video games to um, sort of their fundamentals or to their basics, I think it gives us a little bit of breathing space to understand or to perhaps envisage much broader horizons about the discipline. It allows us to cast off some of the assumptions, the stereotypes, um, or some of the hang-ups that perhaps some, sometimes sort of overshadow the discipline. And so this is the first quote that people come to when they come to the exhibition, when they first see when they come into the exhibition. So it's an exhibition that was uh, seeking to really challenge people's expectations. This was an exhibition that sought to take risks. And for one, this is a show which was deciding to not look back at a nostalgic retro past. Instead, we're looking at video games from the here and now. We're looking at a period of time from the mid-2000s through to the present day. The reason why we decided on that specific time frame is that sort of within the mid-2000s, we have a whole host of technological catalysts from smartphone to broadband to social media all of which have had a radical, radical impact on the way that games are designed, the way that they're discussed, and the way that they're played. Equally, this was an exhibition that was trying to find a new curatorial language for video games. We wanted to look beyond video games purely as a playable object to find new ways of opening up and making visible this as a, as a fascinating design medium. Um, and one of the things that is particularly surprising is that one of the first objects that was ever confirmed as a loan for the exhibition was, in fact, a painting, the, this Magritte painting that you can see, the blank signature, which formed uh, sort of a key inspirational touch point for uh, this scene in Kabul Computer's uh, game, Kentucky Route Zero. And for me, sort of, 
This is something that speaks to what is so intrinsically valuable about bringing video games into spaces such as museums. It is not to say that aligning video games alongside painting, alongside these established sort of artistic masters, it's not to say, great, now video games are elevated to some lofty sort of space. Now these are culture, now this is art. Instead, it's to show how video games as a contemporary discipline is, is not, it does not sit as some sort of isolated cultural design discipline. It is intricately, intricately connected to this long history of visual arts, of literature, of culture, that it is a continuation of the subjects and the mediums and the disciplines that sit within the uh, spaces such as the v &A. And so now I'm just going to show you a short video, which just perhaps gives you an insight into the way that the uh, space was realized. If it's going to play. There we go. So that gives you just a bit of an overview into the sort of space of the exhibition and what we undertook with the show. So as I said just shortly before, um, this was an exhibition that was seeking to identify and find a new curatorial for language for video games. And for that, we wanted to look beyond the game as a playable object, um, to decentralize that as an object for an exhibition. because. Bringing video games into museum spaces and exhibiting it is a complex, complex thing to do. Because inherently, we're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. We're bringing video games, a medium that is plural, a medium that is ephemeral, a medium that is digital, into an institution whose entire structures and infrastructure is centered around valuing the sort of physical object, around sort of objects that exist sort of materially, that have this sort of singularity. And through that, we have this sort of conflict of the way in which uh, we can perhaps sort of view a game in that space. And playable games in terms of an exhibition space, it's not to say that I completely uh, sort of disagree with the idea of bringing a game as a playable work into an exhibition as being the best means of display, but it's really a question of context. This is an exhibition that wanted to open up video games as a design object. And so say if we bring a video game into that space, an object that might take upwards of 30 hours for you to play it before you can really realize or see that as a design object, do you as a visitor have time to have that engagement with that work? Equally, we have issues of capacity. How many people can play a video game in a public space? Uh, we also have issues of literacy. Who comes in with the skills and the knowledge of how to play and interact with a video game in order to be able to perceive it or experience it as a design object? And that's equally to speak of the fear of performance within a public space, that people feel that pressure of performing or playing a video game in public. So if we're not looking at the video game as the sort of key object and we want to find a new curatorial language, what does that look like? How do we approach this? And this way sort of comes back to uh, looking at sort of other areas and other disciplines and the way that they have approached um, exhibiting uh, different design disciplines or equally games. And a really key inspirational work for me is the series uh, by Harun Faroqi, Parallels by uh, One to Four. And this is a series of video installations uh, that the artist created. And when you experience this artwork, you are really surrendering your uh, autonomy as a player to, play, uh, to be able to play these games. It's work that actually has showcases a series of playthroughs of key games like Red Dead Redemption or L.A. Noir. And what you're watching is the artist playing these games in this very intentional and considered way that's very choreographed, but almost seemingly a little bit irrational. 
In his playthroughs, he's sometimes repeatedly pushing NPCs to sort of push their behavior to respond in a different way. He's repeatedly sort of approaching them and sort of pushing their behaviors. Or he's sometimes going through games with a fixed sort of specific path that he wants to travel through sort of any one landscape, but frequently coming up against the invisible walls or barriers that sort of are in place in that game to sort of direct or divert sort of players into other areas. And by watching these playthroughs, by watching this, Timmy, it begins to, you begin to see as a, as, a, as, a, as a person watching this artwork, you begin to see the seams in these video games. You begin to perceive the materiality. You begin to see sort of the considerations and the decisions that the designers have had to have made to be able to create those works. And this installation for me it is perhaps one of the most inspirational in, uh, installations I've seen because it has explained to me or presented to me a video game as a designed object in an exhibition space far greater than actually any exhibition that I'd been to that actually tried to do so through the playable works. And so again, it's looking at spaces or concepts like this of how we can consider curation. And I think for me as a curator, that is really where my provocation starts from. That's where my practice is centered at the moment, is understanding that you as a curator take on the responsibility or the role of a player, that it is your responsibility to look at a video game, to identify what playthrough, what way or what lens do I want you to understand or appreciate this work. So the exhibition was one that was uh, broken across three key sections and those key sections were, uh, the first was new designers. This was a section in the exhibition which is perhaps a slightly more traditional approach to the way that uh, the V&A would normally display design disciplines. It was a space where we looked into the design discipline or the design practice of eight key contemporary video games. It was a very eclectic range of games uh, that were uh, sort of from different genres that were from designers of different scales, so from big AAA blockbusters to small independent studios. Uh, they were games which all had different design ambitions, but the thing that unites every single game within this section, every single game in the whole exhibition, is that they're breaking they're breaking new ground in some way, that they are groundbreaking, they're pushing our expectations of what video games are or what they can be in new ways. In Disruptors, the second section, we looked at the social and political conversations that surround video games and understanding that if we're to really appreciate and respect video games as a contemporary design discipline, we need to have the same critical and nuanced conversations about that discipline as we do any other creative field or medium. And the last section of the exhibition was uh, sort of split into two halves and this is where we were looking at video games from the perspective of the player and understanding that actually no story or no perspective on uh, contemporary design in video games is complete without also acknowledging or appreciating the design stories of the player and acknowledging that the way that many players interact with video games these days transcends the role of the designer. And so we have one sort of space, Players Online, which was looking at the modes of creativity uh, that players engage in mass online games, but equally Players Offline, where we look at the rise of the DIY arcade scene of games that are of niche, of DIY, games of spectacle and performance. But I have limited time this morning to talk you through an exhibition that has been sort of four years in the making. So instead, I'm just going to talk you quickly through one of the games in the first section in New Designers as a bit of a case study about the way that we decided to approach that and to just sort of show you the approach that we took with uh, curating that. So the first game that you come to in the exhibition is Journey, a 2012 game by that game company. And the video is not playing. This is normally the point where I say, I don't know why I choose to work with technology when technology chooses to not work with me. Imagine this video is playing. I'm assuming this is an audience that has a lot of familiarity of that video game. So um, uh, you're normally watching the character sort of surf down the sand dunes at this point. But yeah, so the first game that you come to in the exhibition is uh, 2012's Game Journey uh, by that game company. And this is a game, if you're not familiar, where you play as this robed figure traveling across this desert landscape, journeying towards this sort of mountain peak in the distance. And as you play, you begin to come across other sort of players in the game as you, these robed characters. And these are obviously not other NPCs in the game. These are other players playing that game anonymously alongside you. And 
that game tool company, when they talk about their motivations for this game, they talk about the fact that at the time they perceived the emotional spectrum uh, that was evoked in players through video games to be quite limited. And they wanted to create a game that evoked different emotional responses in players. They wanted to create a game that evoked feelings of love, of empathy, of companionship. And so for us as curators, this was the approach that we took with this work. How do we make visible that creative intent? How do we showcase this as a game that really speaks of this independent design studio creating this sort of ambitious, groundbreaking work? And so the curation work that we undertook for sort of many years was a period of research. It was reaching out to the designers of many of the games that we uh, exhibited in the exhibition. And the thing that we asked them was to open up their notebooks and hard drives to show us, okay, we understand the game as sort of the end, as this sort of end sort of work that you've created, but what sort of materials and artifacts existed from your design process? And it's something that um, sort of for me speaks to the way in which we can consider the curation of video games to be something that can take learnings from, say, a field such as architecture. And, it was something that one of my colleagues at the V&A said to me at one point um, about his work as a curator in architecture. He said, well, as curators in architecture, we don't really ever collect architecture. We collect the debris. And what he's talking about there is not sort of, debris might seem like a dismissive term, but what he's talking about is the fact that architecture equally suffers with these issues of complexity and scale within museum spaces, that there's very sort of strong issues of, uh, of physical scale that show us why architecture is a complex medium to bring into a museum, that you can't necessarily display many buildings inside another building. And so instead, this is a field that's had to work to identify different objects and materials and artifacts that can be brought into an exhibition space that help to present to a visitor and show that as a designed object. And so we spoke with these different designers to get them to show this materiality of this debris that existed from their design process. And the object that you're looking at in front of you is a notebook from Journey's uh, Robin Haneke. And for me, this was something as an object that I really loved that no matter which design studio, which designers we spoke to over the course of our research, so many of them would still come back to the notebook. And when we're trying to connect video games or align video games to these other cultural disciplines, that there is perhaps no one single object which best communicates or illuminates the fact that video games is still a medium that is still built around the same tools or the same sort of practices as other design disciplines as something such as the humble notebook. It's also something which helps sort of remind us of the humanity of the personalities of the people behind video games, which is something for me that is so important to convey. And just to quickly talk through a few of the other objects that we have in this space. So here we have some of the artwork, uh, the concept art by the game's art director, Matt Never. On the left-hand side, we can see sort of the digital concept art, which is one of the first paintings, a digital painting, of the white light of the mountain, which is sort of this end point in the game. And here we see these small characters at the, at the sort of, at the foot of this mountain, of this crevice, and it's again evoking these feelings of being small in a space, of that sense of awe and that need to sort of huddle together in this sort of face of this huge obstacle. And we have the pencil sketches as well, which show Matt Nava's sort of design of thinking about the way in which the character of the game would move through these environments in different spaces. We also have the research as well of the team, and this is a series of videos uh, that the team undertook when they went out to Pismo Beach to, as they sort of in their words, they weren't going out to research to create a game that was trying to sort of be sort of photorealistic. They were not looking for sort of photo photorealistic reality in the game. They wanted it to feel real. So they're going out to see what is it like to jump down the side of a sand dune? What is it like to sort of run across a sand dune with your arms tied to your sides? And again, this is an object in an exhibition space which helps just remind us of the sort of people behind this work. So it puts faces to that. It reminds us of sort of the research that they undertake um, and equally sort of quite humorous in parts. And equally the prototypes of the game, that this is one of the early prototypes of Journey, uh, the dragon prototype, where we see two players traveling through sort of uh, a level, and as they sort of come together, they're sort of able to, they sort of get this sort of white circle that surrounds the players, which gives them the ability to surmount certain obstacles, to be able to achieve things that they wouldn't. So again, looking at a prototype that for many people who are unfamiliar with video game design, this is something which is so visually strikingly different from the end game that it 
helps them to understand this idea of how games designers iterate their practice to think about the way in which uh, the way in which we set up these rules in these systems and do players and do people actually react and respond in the way that we expect them to. I'm also sort of taught romantically about the notebook as a, as a object which can help sort of unite people around sort of this sort of sense of uh, the sense of connection with video games as a design discipline. An object that sort of really resonated with a lot of visitors to the show was uh, was this spreadsheet. Because I think in all honesty, for no matter what discipline or what work you undertake, there's perhaps no object that sort of unites us greater than a really beautifully crafted uh, spreadsheet. And so this was, this was the designer's sort of attempt, sort of quite late on in the development of the game, to map out the emotional journey of the game, but to map that across the different layers and levels of the different aspects of the game and the way in which they all work to feed in towards this idea of the emotional journey that players would go through. And you can see at the top of this, this sort of, um, this sort of curve that's been plotted out that actually maps onto this idea of the hero's journey, if you're familiar with that as a, as a graph or as a concept of an emotional arc that people will progress through uh, through a narrative or a story. Story. And so altogether, these are objects that we brought together into um, this space. And here's a slide which sort of just gives you an idea of the way that these objects were brought into the exhibition. That to visitors coming into the show, that you have this ability to see at a glance or to see in detail this variety of different materiality, the variety of different approaches, the different objects, the different aspects that constitute everything that tells a much fuller and a much richer perspective of journey as a designed, as a complex design object. And this idea of these sort of constellations of objects was something that was repeated across every single game in that, in that first section of the exhibition. And sitting center in that of this sort of uh, collection of objects was a central installation. And the way that I talk about this is to think about this approach, is to thinking about video game, uh, to, to think about these displays as constellations, that we have this sort of constellation of this debris, of this materials and artifacts that speak of the design process, but centered within that is uh, this key installation, a sort of major point that commands attention, that provides an experience, that enables visitors to see that game from a slightly different perspective. And so these are the different installations that we created for each of the games in our first part of the exhibition. And for Journey, it comes back to the fact that as curators, we wanted to show this game as one which was sort of really challenging the emotional journey or the emotional experiences of players. And that's what this installation needed to communicate. We needed to present a way of them being able to see that video game um, sort of in a moment or in a sort of brief glance that sort of the dwell time or anticipated dwell time of any visitor on any one installation is perhaps around about sort of five to six minutes. And so the way that the, we created this was to create, um, to bring together two key scenes from the video game that sort of represented these two emotional sort of high points. So we have the sort of sand surfing level, this sort of emotional high point, this really rich uh, sort of warm space with the sort of joy of surfing down these sand levels. And at the end, we have this sort of a level from later on in the game where you're sort of this character that's struggling up this mountain space with the wind blowing you back, which to visitors enables them to see sort of this game uh, and these two emotional high points of this game sort of at a glance. And in, to, in between each of those, we decided to create uh, something which allowed them to see a cross section of each of the levels. And this was something that was inspired by some of the concept artists that the studio had actually created. And this is some of the early concept or some of the concept art for the game, which shows each of the levels in journey as sort of different cross sections um, where you're allowed to see sort of the fact that the curvature of the ground actually represents sort of that curve of the, uh, the again, that sort of emotional graph that players are expected or anticipated to feel as they go through the game. And so from that, we created this, uh, oh, it's a shame that so many of these videos aren't playing, but, um, what, whoa, whoa, we've gone way too far. Did it do it? Hooray, thank you. Um, so yeah, so you can see here this sort of cross section of actually every single one of the levels in the video game, which again sort of is something that we created, not sort of independently as creators, we created this looking to the intentions, looking to the design objects of the designers, understanding what it was that they were seeking to communicate through their work and choosing how to represent that or trying to find a way that interpreted that game within a physical space that gave people the ability to view that game and to view it sort of as a designed object at a glance. And so bringing all of these objects together is for us sort of 
was a way to try and sort of present to people and to show them these, these, these video games as these complex design objects. And so hopefully through all this, this sort of concept of this debris, this constellation of objects and artifacts from the design process, sort of alongside these sort of installations that provide these different perspectives of video games, that we hope to give them a much fuller picture of that game as a designed object that they perhaps would not have been able to gain had they been brought into the space and just had to watch over someone's shoulder as they play through the game. And so this exhibition was ultimately a risk that we did something that sort of went against the norms of what people expect from video game exhibitions. And it's something that I hope other curators go on to do, that go on to build on this sort of curatorial language that other people have set down before to try different, different radical ways of exhibiting this complex, but, complex medium, but one that is so, so much, that needs so much to have the breathing space that museums and cultural spaces provide to illuminate and provide information and raise the cultural literacy about video games. And ultimately, the response and the reaction that we've had from the games community about this exhibition has one that has been frequently sort of positive and at times emotional, with many designers just sort of saying that they find it so rare and unusual or unexpected to be able to see video games as they understand them and as they appreciate them within these contexts. And that why is why, for me, that it is so important to continue this way, to continue finding different radical ways to explore video games within museum spaces, is to help raise this cultural literacy to help fill the vacuum that an absence of knowledge of the way that video game design exists, to, um, to be able to explore as well, to move beyond survey exhibitions, to explore different niches and alternative histories. So, yeah, so that is a very, very brief overview of just a small aspect of the exhibition, the sort of motivations and approaches that we took to that, and the way that that was realized in this space. As I say, the exhibition will be opening up in uh, V&A Dundee on the 20th of April, and then traveling internationally after that. So if you get the chance to see the exhibition, then uh, please obviously do. Uh, also, I noticed in the GDC bookstore that the exhibition catalog is for sale. So uh, please do also pop over there and take a look at the exhibition back catalog. But, but yeah, thank you so much for coming out this morning and for taking time to listen to the work and to uh, yeah to embrace sort of ideas and conversations about video game curation. Thank you.